because he walks and it will work. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, here we are in week four of Jeremiah. So, uh, and I don't know how it is for y'all, but it's passing pretty fast for me. So, um, last week we were in Jeremiah's temple sermon, uh, where God spoke through Jeremiah to tell Judah. Uh, that God hated their external religious performances that they trusted so much in. And coming to the temple of the Lord to, to perform these religious acts would not keep them from facing destruction that was coming and that they were going to be left in ruin. So today we're going to take kind of a deep dive into what Judah in ruin is going to look like and, and how it's going to happen. But today we're going to end on a happy note. Um, and I've wrestled with this all week long on how to end because I wanted to end on a happy note. And um, even last night I was going back and forth on, okay, which happy note do I end on? But So anyway, we're going to be a little bit out of order at the end, but that's okay because the whole book of Jeremiah is out of order, right? So we'll be fine. All right, chapter 13 opens with five different warnings. Five in one chapter. And what are they being warned about? They're being warned that their sin is bringing judgment on them. And I want to underscore here that, that I say disaster a lot, but this disaster is judgment. And, and we know that uh, because God has declared it to be so. This is not just because we live in a fallen world and bad stuff happens. This is purposeful judgment. <clears throat> okay, so four of the five warnings are, are to the entire nation of Judah. And they start right at the beginning of chapter 13 with a piece of ruined clothing. Okay, so here's just a little bit of housekeeping on this. Depending on your translation of your Bible, you may have something that says loincloth, or you may have something that says sash or belt, okay? Um, girdle. Or, girdle, yeah, Old King James, New King James says girdle. So uh, I think the important takeaway here is, is that this was a linen garment. It was expensive. It was something that you would have taken care of. It was not something that you would have been careless with. And regardless of whether it was some type of underwear or some type of belt or sash, uh, it was to be worn close to your body. It was made to cling to your body, to take the shape of your body. Okay, so, so in verses 1 through 6, we get this, this living parable where God tells Jeremiah to go and buy a loincloth or a sash and to wear it for a period of time. And then he tells him to take it to the Euphrates and bury it. And, and then he comes back home, and after many days, God tells him to go back to the Euphrates and dig it up. Okay, so we're going to pick it up in verse 7. So we're in chapter 13, verse 7. Then I went to the Euphrates and dug, and I took the loincloth from the place where I had hidden it. And behold, the loincloth was spoiled. It was good for nothing. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, even so I will spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be like this loincloth, which is good for nothing. For as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. But they would not listen. Okay, so, so this is Judah in ruin, just like this linen garment. Judah and Israel had had been created by God to be his peculiar people. He set them apart from other nations. They were created to cling to him. And, and this word cling, uh, it, it's the word cleave. It's the same word used in Genesis 2.24, 24, 
where it says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh. They were supposed to be one with Yahweh. They were supposed to have this close, intimate relationship so that when other nations looked at them, they could see that these were the people of God. They were it was supposed to be readily evident. They were supposed to look like a people created for God. They were supposed to carry the name of God like a banner. They were supposed to live in praise to the God who had claimed them as his own. They were supposed to reflect God's glory in a way that would draw all the other nations to him. But they didn't want to cling to him. So he says he'll cast them off, just like Jeremiah cast off this loincloth. And just like the elements wore away and ate away at that fine linen, these evil people, he calls them in verse 10, they're, they're going to be spoiled and useless and good for nothing. They're going to be in ruin. Okay, we get the second warning in verses uh, 12 through 14. So in, uh, in verse 12, you shall speak to them this word. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every jar shall be filled with wine. And they will say to you, do we not indeed know that every jar will be filled with wine? It's like, duh, Jeremiah. Tell us something that we don't already know. Well, of course, every jar is going to be filled with wine. We're the blessed people. We're the chosen ones. But that's not exactly what Jeremiah meant. So in this little parable, the people were actually going to be the jars. And the wine that the jars were going to be filled with, that they were going to be drunk on, was going to be the wrath of God. What should have been a blessing jars filled with wine that was one of the blessings back in Deuteronomy 28 right if they were following the Lord they were going to be flowing with wine but it's going to be turned into a curse and it's going to be the people who sit in the high places and it's going to be the common folk they're, they're all going to be the same and God is going to break the jars this is what it's going to look like for Judah to be in ruin, broken vessels. Because they can't hold the wrath of God. Uh, and 15 through 17, we get a warning about darkness. And remember again, in Deuteronomy 28, God tells them that he's going to visit all of the curses of Egypt on them. And and in Exodus 10, 21, Moses writes that the darkness that fell on Egypt was a darkness that could be felt. Now, I don't know what kind of darkness that is, but it's something that I don't ever want to experience. And Jeremiah implores them to repent before it's too late, before they're left in that deep, stumbling darkness where they can't get out. And there's no light. They're going to be taken to an unfamiliar land among people who they don't even speak the language. They're going to be worshiping foreign gods. And they're going to be in a dark place. It's going to be a darkness of the, their dark night of the soul. And it's going to be a darkness that they can feel down deep in their soul. And this is going to be Judah in ruin. In verses 20 through 27, uh, still in chapter 13, we get a very graphic warning. Uh, Judah has been engrossed in the worship of false gods where they willfully engage in spiritual adultery. We've talked about that before. And God says that they've acted this way in public. They did it out in the open. And therefore, they're going to be subjected to the same public humiliation that a prostitute would face. 
Look in verse 26. I myself will lift up your skirts over your face and your shame will be seen. Okay, most scholars think that this was probably literal. That, that this is referring to when they were taken into exile in order to humiliate them, but in order also to uh, enforce their power over the captives and to keep them submissive, captors would strip the captives naked and make them take the journey in, you know, stripped and humiliated. Uh, so, so yeah, it was the Babylonians that did it, but God says, know that it's him. I myself will lift up your skirts over your face. And this is Judah in ruin. I mean, how many ways can they be in ruin? Okay, so, so those were the four war warnings to the entire nation. And none of this had happened yet, so there was still time for them to repent. Now, the fifth warning um, is, is particularly aimed at the king and the queen mother. So, so we're going to back up a little bit because we skipped over it. But look back at verse 18. Say to the king and the queen mother, Take a lowly seat, for your beautiful crown has come down from your head. The cities of the Negev are shut up with none to open them. All Judah is taken into exile, wholly taken into exile. Okay, this is in reference to King Jehoiachin, and one of the very few references to him in the whole book. He only reigned for three months. We know that it's Jehoiachin, even though he's not mentioned by name because of the reference to the queen mother. Um, most scholars believe that she was very powerful and influential. She had been the, king, the, the, the wife of King Jehoiakim. Um, and, and most likely she was a co-regent with her son. He took the throne at 18. There's one place in scripture that says eight. So, what if he was young, whether it was eight or, or if that's a misprint or a scribe, you know, a scribe that just didn't get it quite right. Uh, he was young. And this warning is to, to both of them. They were the leaders. They yielded the most influence over the people and they were supposed to direct them toward a, their covenantal relationship with the Lord. They were supposed to lead them in the worship of of the Lord, but but instead they led them further away. So God tells them, you're, you're going to be removed from your throne. Your crown is going to be taken off of your head, and, and you're going to be taken into exile. And, and this happened. After only three months of being on the throne, Babylon sieged Jerusalem again, and, and instead of being killed, Jehoiachin surrendered. So he, you know, saved his own neck. And he and his mother were taken into exile. This was the second wave of exiles where they took the, the king and, and the queen mother. They took the high-ranking palace officials. They took a lot of the temple priests. Ezekiel was in this round of exile. Uh, they took the temple false prophets. Um, and they took other wealthy, influential people. The Second Kings tells us that they also took a thousand craftsmen and smiths from the city, which I thought was strange. I mean, they're, they're taking all these influential, powerful people. Why would they take the craftsmen and the smiths? Well, it was, it was probably another power play. The, what they've done now is they've essentially just crippled the infrastructure of Jerusalem. There's, there's not a lot of royalty, high-ranking royalty. There's not a lot of temple priests left. And, and the city is in ruins because it's been ransacked. And now they've taken the craftsmen and the smiths. They can't easily rebuild. Um, 
Okay, all through this chapter, there's a sin theme that kept recurring. Did y'all catch it? This is the first question in your folder. Anybody did that? Pride. Yeah, pride. The Bible has a lot to say about pride, doesn't it? I looked up the definition of pride, and the first and most common use of the word is a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements. Why is pride not a good thing in God's eyes? Because you're not getting your satisfaction from Him. Yeah. Yeah, you're robbing Him of, of His glory. You're, you're taking credit for the display of grace and power that, that He has gifted you. So the nation is overrun by a foreign army. The capital city has surrendered. The king is taken into exile. The priests and prophets are taken. The temple has been ransacked. And, and this is the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem in ruin, just like that loincloth. Just like God said back in verse 9. Okay, one more thing in chapter 13, and then we're going to move on. Um, back in week two, I pointed out a verse uh, in chapter five, um, chapter five, verse 19. We didn't spend any time on it other than I told you that there was a pattern that would emerge. Um, but I didn't tell you what that pattern was. But we see it here again uh, in chapter 13 in verse 22. And if you say in your heart, why have these things come upon me? It is for the greatness of your iniquity that your skirts are lifted up and you suffer violence. Okay, so anybody, y'all probably don't even remember 519, but on the off chance that you do, does anybody see the pattern? It's okay, so we're going to see it again before the end of this morning. So just put a pin in it for now, but have your, have your ears perked up. Okay. All right, chapter 14 and 15, um, sword, famine, and pestilence. This is going to be Judah in ruin. And I'm just going to kind of go through these bullet points and just point out a thing or two here or there. But while I'm going over them, I want you to be mulling around um, in your mind that the, the fact that all these things are awful and and they are real and they are coming. These are warnings. This is actually a, a strange kindness from the Lord. Think about that. We, we touched on this in, in week two. God doesn't just send fire from heaven and annihilate all of them, even though he would be perfectly just in doing that. But he institutes these levels of, of judgment and and each one as, as they ratchet up and they do they're intended to get their attention and turn their hearts back toward the Lord it's it's a strange kindness but it is a kindness from the Lord okay so here we go we're gonna move quickly uh, chapter 14 verse 2 Judah is in mourning, the people lament on the ground, and Jerusalem cries out. Verse 3, her nobles send their servants for water, but there's no water, and they return with empty vessels. All right, so famine has arrived. There's no water. There's no water to divert into those physical cisterns that they've hewn out for themselves. And the rich are at the same level as the poor. Because does their money do them any good? Well, they can't even buy water. Okay, verse 4, the ground is dismayed. It cracks open. Verse 5, the doe forsakes her newborn fawn. Verse 6, the donkeys stand on the bare heights and pant. Their eyes fail. All of creation suffers because of man's sin. And, and famine, um, I'm sure, is a horrible thing. 
but they could have repented before the famine. They had the opportunity. All right, verses 13 through 16. The prophets lie and prophesy to the people in the name of the Lord that famine and sword are not coming and that the people are safe. And because they prophesy falsely by God's name, famine and sword will be how they go. And the people that listen to them, they're going to find their demise in the same way. Okay, so now it's famine and sword. It, it's, it's ticked up a notch, right? But, but at least the sword is quick. I mean, I'm thinking at some point in starvation, you, you probably pray for the sword. But they could have repented at the famine and avoided the sword. All right, in 15.3, God will send four kinds of destroyers. The sword, which we've already talked about, dogs to tear, and birds of the air and beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. Now, how would you rather go? <laughs> by sword? Or by wild, starving dogs tearing you limb from limb or being pecked to death by birds? They could have repented at the sword and avoided the birds and the beasts. They had the opportunity. 15.9, a young mother who has borne seven children has become so weak that she has fainted away. The sun went down on her while it was yet day. Oh, here is a young woman in her prime with seven children. Now, now what is that? What is seven in the Bible? Perfect. Yeah, yeah it's a perfect number. It's completion. Here was a woman that had everything. She was blessed beyond measure. She had seven children. She loses everything. A complete reversal of blessing. And, and she dies of heartbreak, shock. But she could have repented before she lost everything. She had the opportunity. Can you think of a season in your life where God was calling you to repentance, but you didn't listen? I mean, I look back on my life, I can think of several of them. You, you just kept spiraling downward and, and lost all control. And in his grace and mercy, you come out on the other side and you look back and you're like, oh, that was God warning me. Man, why didn't I listen? I, I, why didn't I pay attention? This was, there was a kindness in the chastising. And I could have avoided some of the other discipline. I didn't listen. I didn't accept the kindness that God was offering me in the discipline. And in the midst of all this, God tells Jeremiah for the third time not to pray for these people. They're bad off. And God even goes so far as to say, even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, I wouldn't listen to them either. Now Moses and Samuel, these were two men who, who prayed so hard, and you know, my battery go dead. This is low power. I mean, low battery. Yeah, uh, I may not make it. Uh, Moses and Samuel were two men who prayed so hard, and their prayers were so effectual that God was said to have relented against the judgment that He was going to bring forth, and. And he answered their prayers. But not anymore. The people are too far gone. And they've 
They've wasted all their chances. And this is Judah in ruin. All right, chapter 16. The word of the Lord came to me. You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place, and concerning the mothers who bore them, and the fathers who fathered them in this land. They shall die of deadly diseases. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried. They shall be as dung on the surface of the ground. They shall perish by the sword and by famine, and their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. I'm, golly, poor Jeremiah. Right? I mean, most of us have ups and downs in our lives, but it seems like all Jeremiah gets are downs and downs and downs. For a young man not to be married in this culture was unheard of. Now, I got tickled at one of the commentators because he said that he, he pointed out that biblical Hebrew doesn't even have a word for bachelor. Because <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't happen. The young men get married and have families. But this wasn't just a suggestion from God. God didn't say, you know, Jeremiah, you might want to think about being practical right now because there's a lot of bad stuff coming. Maybe you really don't want to get married right now. And that, that's going to save you a lot of heartache. That, that wasn't it. This was a command. Thou shalt not take a wife or have kids. And, and while it was practical, and it probably did save Jeremiah from, from all of that suffering, that wasn't the point. The, the point was, this was supposed to be a sign to the people. This was another warning about how bad things were going to get, that Jeremiah was going to totally throw off convention and not get married and have a family. And that would have been shocking to people. And, and the hope was that this would have shocked them into attention. Jeremiah, remember, Jeremiah was young when he was called. So he was fully expected to get married and have a family. But he was, he was living out what he knew to be true and he was trying to get them to understand. He stood firm because he believed what he preached. And did you notice the new detail added to the list? It's not just famine or sword or wild beasts or heartbreak. Now there's going to be deadly disease thrown into the mix. What's it going to take? You're scratching your head like, what's it going to take? And then in uh, 16, 10 through 12, we see this. When you tell the people all these words, and they say to you, Why has the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? What is our iniquity? What is the sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? And you shall say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, declares the Lord, and have gone after other gods and have served and worshipped them, and have forsaken me and not kept my law, and because you have done worse than your fathers. For behold, every one of you follows his stubborn, evil will, refusing to listen to me. Okay, what is that? What? I said we're talking pride in today. <laughs> Doing our own thing. Yeah, this is our pattern. Hmm. Right? Y'all hearing it? Y'all seeing the pattern yet? What verse was that? 
That is verses 10 through 12. He answers them, right? I, I find it fascinating that that every time in their ignorance, because they should know, but in their ignorance, they keep asking, why? Why is the Lord doing this? And I find it fascinating that, that the Lord just doesn't say, they should know why. I'm not going to answer them. But he doesn't leave it to chance that they're going to come up with the right answer. He doesn't want them to think that this is just the result of living in a fallen world or that they've just stumbled into some bad luck. He wants them to know why this is happening to them. And, and every time they ask, and, and you'll, you're going to see this a couple more times as you read through Jeremiah, every time they ask, he answers them. long suffering of the Lord because I'd be tired of it by now. Okay, chapter 17. Um, this is where we get a really vivid mind picture of how hard the human heart is and how deeply sin can corrupt. God says in verse 1 that their heart is so hard that their sin has been chiseled with an iron stylus with a diamond point. Now, iron was the strongest metal that they had. And normally, it was plenty strong enough to chisel on stone. But their hearts are so hard that they had to go out and find something harder than iron be able to chip away at, at the hardness of their heart in order to write their sin on it. Verse 2 says that they're so immersed in idolatry that it's the only thing their children remember. They know nothing of worshiping the Lord. It, it's inconceivable to me that they could go from 30 years of Josiah's rule where, where he's following the Lord with all his heart and he's trying to lead the people there with him to, in less than 25 years all the children know is the Asherah poles that's how fast it happens remember back in the end of uh, Joshua, the beginning of Judges, God says that, that the, the generation after Joshua followed the Lord, but then after that, the next generation forgot the Lord. It happens so fast. And I feel like we are just barreling to it in this nation. It's terrifying. It, it should be terrifying. Some people, most people act like they don't, I'm not even concerned. Then at the end of chapter 17, uh, the people get a reminder that God isn't some nefarious spirit in the sky trying to use his power to punish unjustly. He has given them every opportunity to repent. And even now, they have the opportunity to turn from their sin and he will restore the blessing. They're reminded that these oracles of doom are rooted in covenantal conditions. If they will honor their covenant agreement, all of this can be averted. Look in verse 21. So chapter 17, verse 21. Thus says the Lord, take care for the sake of your lives. And do not bear a burden on the Sabbath day or bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. And do not carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath or do any work. 
but keep the Sabbath day holy as I commanded your fathers. Yet they did not listen or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck that they might not hear and receive instruction. Take care for the sake of your wives. Now that's clear. And, and take care to do what? To keep the Sabbath holy. <laughs> take care for the sake of your lives to get your weekly day of rest. I mean, my goodness, of all the commandments, you would think that would be one that they would run to obey, right? <laughs> but they treated the Sabbath like any other day. So do not bear a burden. Do not carry a burden out of your house or do any work on the Sabbath. The, the translation loses a little something here because the, the words used here are, are the words for public business or occupation or laboring for a profit. So they were getting up on Saturday morning and loading up their whatever it was, their wine or their grain or their textiles or their animals and they were going into the city to sell to anybody that came in the gates. Okay, now this is problematic. Number one, you, you weren't supposed to travel very far on the Sabbath. They had a law about how far you could travel. So if you're traveling any distance to get into the city, you're already breaking the Sabbath. But, but now they're coming in to buy and to sell, to trade. This is a direct violation of the fourth commandment. And, and it also speaks to either their lack of trust in God to provide for them, or it speaks to their greed. They thought that God wasn't providing enough for them. They had six days to labor. Seventh day, they were supposed to trust God to provide. They were supposed to set aside that day for it to be holy so that they could worship and they could reflect on their relationship with the Lord. They were to rest in his provision. The Sabbath had always been a problem for Israel. Sabbath was ultimately the reason that they went into exile. Uh, God could have just kept punishing them with the famine and the sword and the pestilence and the death because so far he's been pretty creative, right? He, he hasn't lacked for thinking up any kind of punishments for them. But do you remember what it was about Sabbath that, that actually caused their exile? Remember, they had, had several different kinds of Sabbaths. They had their weekly Sabbath, which was the seventh day they were supposed to rest. But every seven years, what were they supposed to do? Let the ground rest. They weren't supposed to cultivate any crops. They weren't supposed to prune their orchards or their vineyards. They were supposed to trust in the Lord to provide for them that year. And then they had Jubilee Sabbaths, which is every 49 years. And they were supposed to do the same thing. This is an extra Sabbath year. They were supposed to let the land rest for the whole year. And God promised to provide for them in those years where there would be no harvest. Harvest. But they never kept those Sabbath years. Uh, apparently not even one of them. And, and when you add up all of those missed, missed Sabbath years you find out that they had missed 70 Sabbath years. Now, how long was their exile? 70 years. One year for every Sabbath year that they missed. God said the land will have its Sabbath. And that's why they were taken into exile. But here again, God says, if you'll just do this one thing, if you'll honor this one commandment, if you'll show me that your heart is toward me, 
I'll let peace reign. And the throne of David will thrive. You can stay in this land forever. Stop striving to earn your own way. I will provide for you. Hallelujah. That Christ is our ultimate fulfillment of Sabbath. We rest in him. He's, he's done all the work. He's provided the way for us. We don't have to strive to earn our own way. It's impossible anyway. We will end up in ruin, just like these people. God told them, if you keep keeping the Sabbath in an unholy way, in my wrath, I'll burn Jerusalem down. And you'll be left in ruin. Judah in ruin. Okay, so take a deep breath and let it out and turn back to chapter 16. Okay, so we're going back to right after God tells Jeremiah not to pray for these people. And, and even if Moses and Samuel stood before him, he wouldn't change his mind. And he's going to hurl them out of the land in verse 13. And they will go to a land that they do not know serve gods that they do not know and God will show them no favor and in verse 14 God says that the days are coming when these people won't talk about the rescue out of Egypt that was their ancestors the, the Egypt rescue that was their ancestors what these people are going to talk about is being rescued out of the north country Look at the end of verse 15. For I will bring them back to their own land that I gave to their fathers. Oh. They're going to be exiled, but they're going to come back. Verse 16. Behold, I am sending for many fishers, declares the Lord, and they shall catch them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the cleft of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. But first I will doubly repay their iniquity and their sin, because they have polluted my land with the carcasses of their detestable idols and have filled my inheritance with their abominations. And you're thinking, I thought she was going to end on a happy note. <laughs> okay, well, he's bringing them back. Right? Now, now, now we do have a picture of the Babylonian army here. And, and they're going to cast out their net, and they're going to beat the bushes, and, and nobody is going to escape exile. going to bring them back. Look, I, I don't think the language is accidental here. He's going to send out many fishers. What are they fishing for? Men. Women. Now they're, they're fishing for men and women to take captive, but, but the language has to be intentional because he could have said, I'm sending out the Babylonian armies. That's not what he said. He said, I'm sending out many fishers. Do you hear it? Isn't it just like the Lord to redeem the actions of a hateful, evil, godless regime like Babylon and use the same language when he builds his church? I'll make you fishers of men. man means for evil God can redeem and make it good God will fulfill his purposes using the evil nation of Babylon 
are using the disciples of Christ. He will not leave us or forsake us. He's going to bring us back. Okay, so see, that was a happy note, right? <laughs> okay, what attributes or character of God did you see this week? Just again, the long suffering. I'm just overwhelmed by the long suffering of the Lord, His patience, His kindness. Anybody else? Anything else? Well, it's kind of weird, but He doesn't need them. He's self sufficient. Mm -hmm. It's like, I can do without you. Yeah. I don't, you know, I made you, I, you know, I loved you, but I don't need you right now. I'll need you to do the way you're doing me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, his, you know, his intent was for them to be a blessing to the nation, but, but they weren't being a blessing to the nation. They had thrown off that mantle. They didn't want anything to do with it. And then his, his power and justice through it all. It's kind of overwhelming. Yeah. I mean, that you know, what he can do, like all of the things you're talking about, the drought, and the disease, then the, I mean, just do whatever you want. Yeah. And, and he does it in such a way that it's all righteousness. mind-boggling okay and uh, did you see any gospel seeds in this week's reading we will seek God <laughs> will be with us there was uh, There's one place that kind of struck me. I probably won't be able to find it very fast. Um, maybe in chapter 15 or 16. I should have written it down. I didn't. But Jeremiah is, is praying to the Lord, and he says, You are the hope of Israel. And I, that really struck me that, that, that he's the one orchestrating this judgment and yet Jeremiah knows that he's the only hope that they have this Sabbath rest mm -hmm. finding a rest in Christ yeah I started with that part is you see the field of all things mm -hmm. desperately looking for the Lord that was one of the things that I, I wrestled back and forth with that I wanted to include because uh, I was in a Wana verse. <laughs> Those of you have been through a Wana. Um, okay, so next week uh, we're gonna, it's going to be a little bit of a change in pace. We're going to start looking at um, some of Jeremiah's opposition that he's going to face. So it, that's still... And that still falls under the category of sin because the people are in sin when they oppose Jeremiah and his message because they're ultimately opposing the Lord. Um, but it's a little bit different focus. Okay, so, so we'll start that and we'll be there for two weeks. Um, so it won't be quite as long as, as this was. All right, any other questions or comments? Okay, let's pray. Oh, Father God, I just, um, just thank you for being who you are. That you, you are the creator and, and you orchestrate everything on this earth. Your, your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven and 
And you can use even our dark places and our sin for our good and your glory. And gosh, we don't understand that, but but Lord, we thank you that that's the kind of God that you are. That if, if we are redeemed and if we are finding our Sabbath rest in Christ, that, that you won't hold our sins against us. And Lord, we thank you that you can take what men mean for evil and you can turn it to good. You are glorious and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.